Now, from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Good evening. Great to see you all. Welcome to the World Over Live. Lots to share with you tonight. Here to kick things into high gear is the always reserved president of the Catholic League, Bill Donahue. He'll join us to discuss some recent outrages in the media and his ongoing efforts to pay tribute to Mother Teresa at the Empire State Building in New York. We'll also discuss this new Comedy Central animated series with Jesus as its central character. Bill Donahue is with us for the whole hour, so if you've got a question for Bill or a comment, email us or call now. The number is 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205-271-2980, or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN.com. We have much to get to. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. <music> Terrible news out of Turkey. Bishop Luigi Padoves, head of the Turkish Bishops' Conference, was stabbed and killed at his home on Thursday. The assailant was the bishop's driver of almost five years. 27-year-old Murat Altun confessed to the murder, telling authorities, I had a re revelation and I killed him. Turkish authorities say that the killing was not politically or religiously motivated, but personal, and that Altun was mentally ill. According to reports, the local Catholic community has raised doubts about these claims. Bishop Padoves was 62. And in a related story, the murder has overshadowed the start of Pope Benedict's apostolic journey to Cyprus on Friday. Bishop Padoves was among the church leaders scheduled to meet with the Pope for a pre-synod discussion of the church's mission in the Middle East. Before landing, Pope Benedict said he was saddened by the killing and appeared to accept church, uh, Turkish rather, authorities' explanation that it was not a political or religious motivated assassination. This, he said, has nothing to do with the themes and realities of this trip. We must not give responsibility to Turkey or the Turks, end quote. Cyprus is ethnically divided between Turks and Greeks and is viewed by the Vatican as a bridge between Europe and the Middle East. And a sober and somber words came from Pope Benedict earlier this week after the deadly flotilla clash between the Israeli Navy and aid workers attempting to break a Gaza black blockade. At the conclusion of his Wednesday general audience, the Holy Father condemned the violence and said that he is following the tragic and painful events with great trepidation. He further called the incident troubling to the Middle East peace process, but urged political leaders to continue to seek just solutions that guarantee the best condition of life, harmony, and serenity to the people of the area. And in the wake of the clerical sex abuse crisis in Ireland, the Vatican this week announced an apostolic visitation to the church there. Pope Benedict has called for a Vatican-directed initiative that will delve into the handling of abuse cases and seek to improve abuse prevention procedures. Additionally, the Vatican will consider the, quote, assistance owed to victims. And in a separate but concurrent visitation, Irish seminaries will also be examined. The Vatican conducted a similar investigation of American seminaries five years ago after the sex abuse crisis rocked the U.S. church. Archbishop Timothy Doland of New York will head the seminary investigation. Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston is among the bishops leading the visitation in general. The Irish bishops have promised full cooperation. And in Los Angeles, the sex abuse scandal there continues to overshadow the archdiocese and the soon-retiring Cardinal Roger Mahoney. 
the younger brother of a man who helped put a priest behind bars for sexual abuse, has filed a lawsuit alleging he was also molested by the since laicized Michael Baker. The lawsuit alleges that Cardinal Mahoney and the Archdiocese failed to protect him from Baker. A spokesman for the Archdiocese said they have yet to see the lawsuit and reiterated that Baker lied to Archdiocesan officials about molesting boys. Meanwhile, one of two sex abuse cover-up investigations against the L.A. Archdiocese appears to be coming to an end. An L.A. district attorney issued a memo Wednesday saying even though these abuse cases suggest the possible or possibility of criminal culpability, investigators don't have enough evidence to file charges. The case was hampered by victims' reluctance to help investigators and the statute of limitations. The federal grand jury investigation against the archdiocese continues. And the Archbishop of the Military Services is urging the U.S. Congress to allow the military's don't ask, don't tell policy to remain in effect. The policy allows gays to serve in the U.S. military so long as their orientation remains private. In a June 1st statement, Archbishop Timothy Broglio reported that many chaplains and commanding officers have expressed concerns over the effects of allowing gays and lesbians to serve openly in the armed forces. Additionally, he wrote, Catholic chaplains must show compassion for persons with a homosexual orientation, but can never condone, even silently, homosexual behavior, end quote. He went on to say that a change in policy might negatively affect the role of the chaplain in the pulpit, the classroom, the barracks, and the office. This past week, the Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal passed both a full House vote and a Senate panel. Korean church leaders have reacted with horror to a court ruling declaring frozen embryos to be, quote, not human. The recent pronouncement by South Korea's constitutional court allows for the routine destruction of human embryos in research and artificial fertilization procedures. Cardinal Nicholas Cheong of Seoul told the Fides News Agency that the decision is contrary to human life and to science itself. He added that the small Christian community there is obligated to raise the consciousness of the otherwise indifferent population. Meanwhile, Pope Benedict's prayer intentions for June were seemingly tailored for the news. The Holy Father will pray that national and international institutions respect human life from conception to natural death, and that the little flock in Asia may know how to communicate the gospel and give joyful witness to their adherence to Christ. Back in the U.S., according to a new report released by a Catholic watchdog group, Reform CCHD Now, the U.S. bishop's Catholic campaign for human development, quote, remains involved in activities directly opposed to Catholic moral and social teachings, end quote. The report details close to 50 CCHD-funded organizations linked to activities opposed to Catholic teaching. Reform CCHD now says they've mailed the report to every bishop and diocesan pro-life director in the U.S. The Catholic Campaign for Human Development came under growing scrutiny last year after it was forced to withdraw grants from the embattled community organization ACORN and other community organizations actively working to promote abortion and gay rights. And the Bishop of Davenport, Iowa, has spoken out against the upcoming ordination of a woman priest in his diocese. On June 13th, Mary Kay Kushner, a married mother of four, is planning on being ordained by a fringe organization that has attempted to ordain several women as Roman Catholic priests in recent years. Kushner was ordained a deacon by the dissident group last year. Bishop Martin Amos has informed the faithful of Davenport that they should not attend the ceremony, warning that participating in or advocating for such a ceremony results in excommunication. And a couple of appointments to dioceses were released this week. Pope Benedict XVI has named a coadjutor for the Diocese of Trenton, New Jersey. Father David O'Connell, the recently retired president of the Catholic University of America, just across the street from our studios here in D.C., will replace Bishop John Smith, 
who reaches the mandatory retirement age of 75 later this month. The date on which Father O'Connell will become Trenton's new shepherd was not announced. And on Wednesday, the most reverend Thomas Wenske was installed as the fourth Archbishop of Miami, Florida. He replaces the now retired Archbishop John Favalora. During the installation mass, Archbishop Wenske called for a greater Catholic presence in the public square to fight the dictatorship of relativism. The Archbishop is a native of Miami. Most recently, he served as the Bishop of Orlando. We wish Archbishop Wenske and Bishop-designate O'Connell the very best. Up next, when we return, the president of the Catholic League, the one and only Bill Donahue joins us to talk about the war being waged on religion and culture in America. The World of Alive continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. My guest tonight is best known as the president of the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights in New York City. He's also a noted educator and sociologist. He's author of the best-selling Secular Sabotage, How Liberals Are Destroying Religion and Culture in America. Joining us live from New York, would you welcome Bill Donahue. Bill, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me, Ray. Bill, I want to start with this Mother Teresa controversy. This seemed like a simple request. Now, you initiated this request to the folks who own the Empire State Building, correct? You, you basically want to honor her on the anniversary of her 100th birthday by having the, the Empire State lit in blue and white lights, which is something they're constantly changing the lighting scheme to honor this day or that figure. So what's the problem here? That's right. This goes back to, uh, you know, 1976, uh, July the 4th, when the Empire State Building decided to shine red, white, and blue into the sky. I remember that night very, very clearly. And ever since, they do it for the Yankees and they win, or uh, they do it for uh, Hanukkah, they do it for Christmas, St. Patrick's Day, Muslim uh, holidays and the like. Uh, all kinds of reasons. As a matter of fact, last year, last September, they honored the communist Chinese who murdered 77 million innocent people in China since 1949. So I thought this would be a slam dunk. I found out in January that the United States Postal Service was going to issue a commemorative stamp for Mother Teresa on the 100th anniversary of her birthday, August the 26th. I had never petitioned the Empire State Building to shine its lights any color for any event uh, ever in my life. I did so on February the 2nd. I filled out the form, did the application right by the nines, everything complete. They got back to me right away, and they said, fine, uh, everything is done the right way, and we'll let you know in June. All right, I didn't know why it would take that long, but I guess they have their reasons. I found out in May, with a fax, unsigned, without explanation, that my request was denied. Uh, I mean, I was absolutely blown away. I could hear, here's Mother Teresa being denied the honor of her colors, blue and white, on her anniversary, when well, I don't need to tell the audience or all the great things that this woman has done, and they're going to do it without explanation? I said, we'll see about this. So I started putting out some news releases. I started a petition. We now have over 30,000 people who have signed our petition in the matter of a couple of weeks on this, and I'm sure we'll get a lot more. But now we've gone to another stage. It's not just a matter of a petition, because Anthony Malkin, M-A-L-K-I-N, Anthony Malkin is the owner of the Empire State Building. He refuses to give a reason as to why the committee made their decision to stiff Mother Teresa and the Catholic community in general. We know why. It's anti-Catholicism, and they can't come out and say it. What other reason could there possibly be? They do honor other religious figures, so that can't be it. No, we know what the reason is. So what I'm going to do, and I'm writing to Catholic schools and ethnic groups. I've started uh, with this a few weeks ago. I'm going to turn Catholics into the street by the thousands, on Thursday night, August the 26th. I've already met with the New York City Police Department. They're going to give me 34th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue, and if necessary, between Madison and 5th. I'm hoping to fill the entire avenue that night to protest this outrageous, obscene decision. The good news is I've got a, I'm getting a lot of support from bishops, from non-Catholics, 
from the New York City Council. You'll be hearing more about that in the next week, even from some people who are not always on our side. Regrettably, the only people I know who are working against the Mother Teresa campaign, who think it's the wrong thing to do. I only know of three people in the whole world. One is a Catholic priest from New Jersey. The other is the uh, guy who runs the Catholic newspaper in an archdiocese in this country. I'm not going to mention his name at this point because I've just contacted his boss, the archbishop, to let him know what's going on. He said that we're not going to get involved in this Mother Teresa crap. That was the exact words of this man. I have Jews who are defending Mother Teresa, but I have people working against me. And Paul Moses over at Commonweal, not surprisingly, magazine, a Catholic publication, he says that I'm engaged in manufactured outrage. Liberal Catholics, at least some of them, do not want to see Mother Teresa honored. Jews that I've talked to, Buddhists, Indians, bishops, people from all over, lay people, uh, priests, I mean, they're all in favor of Mother Teresa. New York City Council people, including uh, a, a noted lesbian uh, Catholic uh, uh, speaker of, uh, in the city council, uh, who's not normally on our side. Everybody except for these uh, three Catholics is, is in favor of it. And, Bill, what is your answer to them, to your critics, who say this is manufactured and you're just sort of running with this on your own? Well, how did, the only way I could manufacture this is if I'm in cahoots with the Empire State Building to stiff Mother Teresa. I mean, after all, I made the petition asking them simply to have this day set aside for her and to shine the lights blue and white for the colors of her congregation that night. The only way it could be manufactured is if I wanted it to fail and then get media attention for myself. I don't lack for media attention on a lot of different things, so I certainly wouldn't do it to Mother Teresa on this. No, there's, the, there's something about the Catholic left. They really feel uncomfortable about certain matters Catholic. I, 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 I have some ideas to what's driving it, but by the way, most liberal Catholics, I'm sure, would not be on the side of these people. But the fact that they hold some prominent positions is deeply disturbing. Bill, let's talk for a moment about this uh, boy, a 13-year-old boy in Schenectady, New York. He goes to school with a rosary around his neck. Um, the school officials say, you cannot wear this rosary, and they throw him out of school for wearing it on the outside of his clothing. Uh, your thoughts on this? Now, they say this is a symbol of gang-related uh, activity, and therefore, for the safety of everybody, he shouldn't wear a rosary. You say what? Well, let me tell you something. I, I taught 20 years in education, everything from the second grade through graduate school, and I've been confronted with these situations in the past. And there was a situation, I can't tell you right off the top of my head what city it was, it was about five or six years ago, when I, I did side with the school, and I'll tell you why. Because in that particular case, it was clear that some gang was using, abusing, I should say, misusing the rosary as a symbol and getting more members. And, you know, at that point, I said, no, this is not about any kind of reverential religious devotion. Uh, this is, this is a, an abuse of a religious symbol for violence. So I sided with the school in that particular instance. In this particular instance, I looked at the situation, was interviewed by the press about this the other day, and this, this kid is involved. It has absolutely nothing to do with any gang whatsoever. This is obviously a case of religious discrimination. Now, th there's two things I look for in this situation is, was a gang using it? And if that's not the case, the only other thing I, that I'd look at is, do they have disparity of treatment? That is to say, if they're allowing other religious, uh, other kids to use the religious symbols of another religion and not ours, that's a clear case of discrimination. If they're banning all of them, that's a different kind of situation. In this particular case, th there's no gang related whatsoever. If the school wants to rewrite its policies, make it a little bit tighter, uh, I, I would encourage them to do so. For those of you joining us by radio or television, you can give us a call, 1-800-221-9460, or internationally, 205-271-2980. And our email is up and running, world over at EWTN.com, if you have a question for Bill. Bill, just one more point before we leave this. So you consider this a religious expression case? I mean, I, I think quite apart, whether it's religious expression or not, I was always taught, you don't wear a rosary, you pray a rosary. I mean, this is like wearing a holy water dispenser on your head to school. I mean, it's, it's just inappropriate, isn't it? Well, it is inappropriate, but I also think that the school should exercise greater discernment in, in how they handle this kind of thing. Uh, I, I'm the, I don't know anything about the kid, obviously. I don't, 
I, I, I don't know what he I, looks. People walk around with baseball caps with with the with the cap facing backwards. I mean, I, I don't know what we live in a crazy world with people. Uh, I don't think the kid was using the rosary in the right way. But do I know that he intentionally did it to be malicious? I don't know. He's probably just a, another dumb kid like most of them. No, <laughs> he says he's wearing it on the external, uh, you know, outside to remember his dead uh, uncle and brother or something. And so, I mean, I'm sure he's well intentioned, but you know, I it is a misuse of what to is talk a to him. prayer tool. Yeah, right. we should we should have a little sit down with him next time we're in Schenectady. Uh, let's go on. I want to show this to you and uh, share this with the audience. This is the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi who a few weeks ago, I guess, became speaker of the gospel. Here is an excerpt from her address to a national Catholic reporter, Washington Briefing. This is a left of center magazine in the Catholic Church. Give a listen to her words. And Bill, I'd love your commentary on this. They ask me all the time, what is your favorite this? What is your favorite that? What is your favorite that? And at one time, what is your favorite word? And I said, my favorite word, that is really easy. My favorite word is the word, is the word. And that is everything. It says it all for us. And you know the biblical reference. You know the gospel reference of the word. And uh, that word is, uh, we have to give voice to what that means in terms of uh, public policy that would be in keeping with the values uh, of the word, the word. Isn't it a beautiful word when you think of it? Just covers everything. The word. <laughs> fill, you know, fill it in with anything you want, but of course we know it means uh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among the stuff. So, Bill, uh, what do you make of the theologian uh, there? You know, at that kind of uh, talk, I really, I'm being very sincere about this. I'm not being flipped. It's what I would expect if I walked in unannounced into an asylum. Really. I mean, I, I, it, I, I am absolutely astonished to think that she is two seats away from the presidency of the United States. The woman is a walking embarrassment. The word is not an empty vessel that you can pour anything in the word you can. Well, you know what's striking to me, too? Why did the people, the lefties over at the National Catholic Reporter, find this acceptable? I mean, had she been in, in front of uh, Orthodox Catholics, uh, they would have run her out of town. I mean, this is absolutely mind-boggling. I, 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 I feel embarrassed for her. I don't know why I, I, I do. Maybe it's because she is a fellow Catholic. Um, I did send her a copy a couple of years ago when she started shouting off about abortion and what the Catholic Church teaches. I did send her a copy of Briganti and Trigilio, the great Catholic priests. I know these guys. Catholicism for dummies. I sent her a free copy of Catholicism for Dummies. She hasn't read it, obviously. I don't know what we're going to do with this lady. There's no bounds. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I just, I mean, it, it just leaves me exasperated. Yeah. I, I think most people listening to that were exact. I couldn't follow it. It kind of meanders all over the place. It was fast. We didn't cut that, by the way. That is a contiguous cut of, of, of the first uh, the speaker's uh, comments. So there were no edits there. It was her complete word, to use a common word. Um, Sister Carol Keehan. Bill, also spoke at that same gathering that we just uh, shared with the viewers at that National Catholic Reporter Washington briefing. She is set to give the commencement address at Gonzaga University, a very prominent Catholic school, uh, Gonzaga High School, rather, uh, an important and, and esteemed Jesuit institution here in Washington, D.C. Your thoughts on this, given her role in advancing the health care legislation and subverting the will, quite frankly, of the bishops of the U.S. throughout that debate? Well, she did subvert the will. I was very proud as a Catholic. I, in, in the last 17 years in doing this job as president of the Catholic League, I don't think I've ever seen the bishops collectively stand up to the plate as much as they did on the health care. They were marvelous, excellent. One bishop after the other made it very, very clear. Yes, we want universal health care. They've been very consistent on that. Uh, some conservatives don't like that. I'm with the bishops. I want universal health care. Uh, there's different ways in which it can be achieved, but I like that idea. I also think that the bishops did the right thing by saying we will not bend our principles. We will not subvert our own principles. Health care means 
including the unborn, it, a, as well as the aged. It means everybody across the board, independent of, uh, of every kind of demographic criteria. And we were this close from winning, and that this nun would subvert the, in, the will of the bishops by teaming up with Nancy Pelosi and Bart Stupak, giving them cover, which is why President Obama gave her one of the 22 pens that he signed on this legislation. Now, the bishops were right about abortion. She is wrong about it. Now, in terms of Gonzaga, you know, I remember the situation about a year ago when uh, the President of the United States was being honored at Notre Dame University. I defended his right to speak at Notre Dame, but not to be honored. To be honored means something else altogether than be allowed the right to speak. And quite frankly, uh, a man who believes that abortion extends to a selective infanticide, he believed that when he was in the state senate in Illinois, that it was okay to deny any type of medical uh, treatment to a child who had been born uh, as a result of a, a botched abortion. To think that he would go quite that far in his passion for abortion rights and then be honored at Notre Dame University, that was, that was a real tragedy in American Catholic history. I debated some Catholics, including some very well-known Catholic liberals, whom I said to them this, and this, this applies now to Gonzaga. I'd like to ask the Jesuit president of Gonzaga the same question. I am opposed to anti-Semites getting an award at a Catholic school at graduation time. I am also opposed to people who are pro-abortion from getting an award at a Catholic school at graduation time. I need these people to explain to me why they're with me when it comes to anti-Semitism, but they're not with me when it comes to abortion. I want one of them, just one, to have the courage to come out and tell me why. I don't, I've asked this question many times, not one of them has the guts to tell me why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bill, I want to share this with you. This is uh, Father Jenkins, who uh, you just referenced a moment ago. He said this week, he made a statement to a local paper. He said that the visit to Notre Dame, President Obama's visit, had a positive effect and influence on the president. He, quote, heard things he wouldn't otherwise have heard, and he made statements he wouldn't otherwise have made. I mean, I think you have to agree with him there. Where else could you stand on a Catholic platform and say, open hearts, open minds is what we really need on all these issues, and that this abortion thing, we've got to find common ground on it? Well, the idea that Obama had to go to Notre Dame to hear what Catholics think about abortion is preposterous. They could have sent him a cassette, couldn't they? Uh, couldn't they have asked him to send, send some reruns of EWTN? They could have had you go out there and talk to the president, right? So he didn't have to do that. Now, in terms of what the president has learned from it, you know, I don't deal in vagaries. I don't write essays. I write specifics. I have attribution. I have footnotes. I have endnotes. I have specifics. I'd like to ask Father Jenkins, Get away from the generality now, Father. Be specific. Tell me one specific thing that President Obama did that made him different than he was before he came to Notre Dame a year ago for the graduation. What exactly can you point to that he altered his behavior, even his rhetoric, one iota? I'm waiting for the answer, Father. And you can look me up in the phone book. Okay, well, keep me posted on the response you get from Father Jenkins. Bill, I want to go to the phones now. This is uh, Raymond from California. Raymond, I love your name. Go ahead. Hello, Raymond. I'm calling to Hello. tell you that I was at school, and my teacher said that the principal said that I have to take off the rosary around my neck because church and state don't go together. And that... Hmm. Uh, was this a public school or a Catholic school? No, it's a public, public school. school. Okay. They said I can't have it around my neck because it might, church and state don't go together and might offend any of the Protestants in the class. Hmm. Bill, what's your reaction to that? Well, you know, there's two ways in which you can deal with this. You can either do it the tolerant way, which is you educate the bigot, or you can do it with the intolerant way in which you can ban the kid who wants to re express himself religiously. I don't know why it is that we do, we do the same thing at Christmas time. We say to the people, well, we have to ban the crash because some people find it offensive. You know, I've asked the ACLU about this when it comes to obscenity on the street. They say, well, just avert your eyes. That's the democratic remedy for obscenity on the street in terms of a newspaper man on the corner in New York City. That should be the answer, the democratic remedy to these people. If you find the religious symbol offensive, then get an education. In the meantime, avert your eyes until you become a little smarter. Is Raymond still on the phone there? Yes. Raymond, uh, I have a question. Why are you wearing a rosary around your neck in public? 
I mean, that's well, little... it was a it was a Saint Benedict rosary, and our parish priest said that we could wear it because it shows that Saint Benedict is a protector of us, and it's also a rosary that you pray with. You're not supposed to wear a rosary and not pray it. Right. Well, well no, I, I I mean, I would start. You don't get, get a Saint Benedict medal. What are you wearing a rosary for? I mean, well, I know I it's, it's I know it's become chic in some you know, uh, areas of society. I mean, I see the runway models with the rosaries and things, but, uh, you know, it's kind of a misuse of a sacramental, right? Yes, you're right. And it's not the, no kind of rosary. It's a wooden rosary, and it's uh, different like that. But I actually bought a St. Benedict crucifix now. Okay, well, that's a better, a better uh, accessory when you go out. Thank you, Raymond, for the call. Yes. Bill, we'll be right back. In the meantime, give us a call, 1-800-221-9460, internationally, 205-271-2980, or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. More with Bill Donahue, and we'll talk about that Comedy Central series, JC, on the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. Still with us via satellite from New York is the crusading president of the Catholic League and author of the book Secular Sabotage, Bill Donahue. Bill, thanks for staying with us. Uh, I want to get into this controversy. Uh, Comedy Central recently said they were developing a new program, an animated series called J.C., about a sort of disgruntled son who's been living in his father's shadow, and it's basically Jesus Christ living in New York City. Uh, your thoughts on this? I know you've joined this religious coalition, Citizens Against Religious Bigotry. What's the story here? Why are you so offended? Well, first of all, uh, I've I, I got to give the credit to Brent Bozell, who's a uh, member of the Catholic League Board of Advisors and a great guy. He does magnificent work at the, family, at the Media Research Center. Uh, I joined with him, Michael Medved, Rabbi da David Lappin, Tony Perkins, uh, Tim Winter. All of these are distinguished Catholics, Protestants, and Jews. We're fed up. We've had it with Comedy Central. First of all, with the unrelenting attack on Catholics, and secondly, with the fact that they uh, do it to the exclusion of other groups. To be specific, uh, Muslims are never, ever addressed on Comedy Central. Now, Trey Parker and Matt Stone are the writers for South Park. I've had some problems with them in the past. They actually made a figure of me, a cartoon, cartoon figure. Uh, the good news, Ray, is that I became the Pope. The bad news is that Jesus got me in the end. So I don't think in the end I really came out too well on that. But you know what? I can laugh at myself. They had a good time parodying me. And, I, and that's okay. I don't care about myself. When you do it to my religion in a vile way, that's something altogether. Parker and Stone, the writers for South Park, have said explicitly that if Catholics don't, don't want to be dumped on, then all you have to do is to act like Muslims. Well, Catholics being Catholics are not going to resort to violence, and they shouldn't, but that's not an excuse for Hollywood then not to practice ethical behavior. We know from the pedigree of South Park and everything that Comedy Central does that they're not likely to give us some nice, reverential little uh, J.C. character. Uh, and look, I don't care if you want to have a little fun. Mel Brooks makes fun of Catholics and Jews and blacks and others, but he never does it in a mean-spirited way. Nobody got upset with Sister Act, unless you're crazy. Uh, we're talking about when you hit below the belt. And they've done that several times uh, on South Park, and we think we could be uh, getting this fair again. What Brent Bozell has done, and I'm with him, uh, we sent out a letter to 200 sponsors or so, putting them on our notice. We don't want this. Now, here's an inter interesting thing. Comedy Central has not said it's definite. They've not said it's a lock, a slam dunk, that they're going to do this JC, this animated Jesus cartoon coming up in the fall. They say it's being considered in production. I think it's a trial balloon, honestly. I think they're waiting to see, is there going to be any resistance? And since there already is resistance from distinguished Catholics, Protestants, and Jews, uh, my guess is that we won't have to be suffering this indign indignity uh, in the fall. But I could be wrong. 
Now, Bill, you said that you would reach out to Muslims because Jesus is a revered figure in the Quran. Uh, have you done that yet to get them to join this effort? I've sent it out to many of the different Muslim organizations. Uh, we don't really pair with them uh, too often, quite frankly. I tend to pair more with Protestants and Jews. Uh, but there have been occasions when I've been aligned with Muslims. I do appreciate the way Muslims stood up for the family uh, in the UN. And so I may not agree with uh, everything, everything they do. I certainly don't agree with the terrorists, uh, who are, are all too many within their ranks. And I certainly loathe Sharia law. So they've got a lot of cleanup there uh, to do in their own backyard. But that's not to say there aren't good Muslims and, and legitimate Muslim organizations. And I think they should be aware of the fact that uh, they're being dumped on in a kind of a backdoor way. Uh, I want to bring this to our viewers' attention. We got an email from Brad in Lincoln, Nebraska, and he says, quite rightly, the boy we spoke of earlier who's wearing the rosary, wears a purple rosary to school, they say it seems entirely defensible to me. The idea that the boy is innocent and has good intentions is not merely or maybe or probability. It's definitely innocent and definitely good intentions. Uh, apparently, he wears it in memory of his younger brother who died while clutching the rosary after a bicycle accident. So, well, uh, well, you know, the school the, the, authorities the young must boy have known there. about that, right? Uh, one would if imagine the school, they would. Yeah, well, see, I don't know the whole context about this thing, but if, if the school authorities knew why this kid was doing it, now they look like bigger bullies uh, than ever before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and someone else asked, well, why are you upset, Raymond, that people are wearing a rosary? Mother Angelica wears a rosary. Now, wait a minute. That is different. The religious wear the rosary on the side as part of their habit. They, they're not wearing it around their neck as jewelry. And that was my, my uh, question. Not that religious shouldn't be wearing religious paraphernalia or sacramentals. Let's get, let's be honest here, guys. Let's go to the phone. Marie from Wisconsin. You're on The World Over Live. You're a little upset about the Pelosi uh, discussion earlier. Why? Well, first of all, Raymond, I want to tell you, you have a beautiful voice. Uh, I just love listening to your singing. You have a talent. Oh, you're very kind. And, uh, this gentleman and Mr. Donahue, um, I respect all his opinions, and I enjoy watching EWTN with all my okay. heart. Okay, well, what's your comment? My, Go ahead, Marie. My comment, my comment is tonight, though, I was very saddened that uh, Mr. Donahue, even though he has his opinion about Mrs. Pelosi, they're our country's leaders, and Catholicism is a religion that teaches everybody to not be judgmental. And uh, I was surprised that uh, Mr. Donahue said that because he never impressed me as uh, doing that. And my husband was in the room, and he's a, con a convert. Okay. And uh, he was very saddened about this also. Let me let Bill react to that, uh, Marie. Thanks for the call. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, you shouldn't be judgmental, though, the lady said. I am honestly astonished how many people say, who make a judgment that I'm not, that I'm too judgmental. You had to have made a judgment in order to make the judgment about me. So I guess we're all equally guilty. Is that the point here? Look, of course this woman's judgmental of, of me, and that's her opinion, and I respect it. My opinion is that Nancy Pelosi is an insincere Catholic. All right? I want to go on record. She's an insincere Catholic. A sincere Catholic stands with the teachings of my religion and in her religion, and that is to say that you begin with the most fundamentals. Intrinsically evil is what the catechism regards abortion. There's never been a single abortion in the United States' history that this woman hasn't championed. She's a proponent of partial birth abortion. So when she plays the religion card selectively, I say she's insincere, and that is a judgment that I will stand by. Okay, Bill, I want to move on to Time Magazine. They did a piece on Pope Benedict XVI in a recent cover story. The cover story was, Why Being Pope Means Never Having to Say You're Sorry. And in it, Jeff Israeli and Howard Chua Eon uh, suggest that Pope Benedict has somehow damaged the magisterium and papal power because he can't apologize. And they, the authors wonder why he hasn't apologized for his own role in the scandal. Your thoughts on this column well, and cover story. First of all, they need, a, they, they need a copy editor. Uh, quite frankly, if you read their article about six paragraphs later, they quote the Pope apologizing. So how can he be charged with not apologizing when they quote him for apologizing? What this article was really about was this. They want the Pope to admit that he did something wrong, but he didn't. 
Lori Goodstein tried very, very hard over at the New York Times to get him, and she couldn't get him. Time Magazine wants to apologize for something he didn't do. And on top of that, they really want to go to the heart and soul. What they're saying is they play fast and loose. They don't even understand these clueless people over at Tom, Time Magazine what infallibil infallibility means. And they want the Pope to basically say, I'm going to renounce the throne of Peter. I am just like everybody else. I am never right. I am never wrong. I apologize for what I have done, for what the church has done, not just individual people. I mean, they really wanted to go for, for, for the jugular. You know, if they keep going that way at Time Magazine, they will go out of business just as Newsweek Magazine is presently going out of business. You know, they say, Bill, that uh, their upsetment is, they said the apology for the Irish situation doesn't count because Benedict wasn't involved there, and that somehow that apology really doesn't mean anything. I mean, uh, how, how many times does he have to apologize? He really has apologized repeatedly on multiple journeys, on his way to Malta, when he was here in the United States. I mean, I, I, I really don't know what they're looking for. Oh, I know what they're looking for. They're, it's never enough. It's never enough. They'll never be satisfied. It's like these professional victims group, like SNAP. These people are ideologically hardwired hard to be against the Catholic Church. They are bigots. They are the secular sabotages that I wrote about in Secular Sabotage. They hate the Catholic Church with a passion. It will never, never, never be enough. Philip Pullman uh, and, and this guy who gave us the golden compass, I fought that successfully, came on your show a couple of years ago. There's no sequel to it, no subtle knife. He came out just yesterday and said, I would hope that the Catholic Church would simply vanish off the face of the earth. All you have to do is go to the Huffington Post, go to RH Reality Check, go to Alternet, go to these various left-wing liberal sites, go even sometimes to Commonweal and the National Catholic Reporter. Find out what they have to say about the Pope, about the bishops and the like. You don't have to even travel uh, into secular circles to see this. The vitriol, the vile, obscene attacks that are nonstop, and I'm not talking about fair criticism. Catholic Church is open to fair criticism. I'm talking about below the belt, relentless assaults, which are never done to any other group. I am fed up with it, and I will fight it to my dying day. Let's talk about Nicholas Kristof's recent piece. It was a column in the New York Times on this nun in Phoenix who was a member of this board, the head of this ethics board, and she determined that it was perfectly legitimate to abort a child in a Catholic hospital. She went ahead and, in the words of Christoph, saved the life of a mother. And rather than being praised, her bishop, Bishop Olmsted, said she had excommunicated herself. It made it seem as if the bishops are really the bad guys. Uh, unravel this for us. What's going on here? Is this, is this Catholic bigotry, Bill? Or is this just misunderstanding of church policy and teaching? Well, I wouldn't call it bigotry, but it's not misunderstanding either. I'm not certain exactly what term I'd employ, but I think it's deception. And I'll give you an example. You take a look at that piece, plus the other one by Christoph about a week or so earlier, and here's what you're getting. This is what the narrative is coming from Nicholas Christoph. There are two Catholic churches. There's the bad Catholic church, which is the hierarchy. It's those bishops, you see, who are the bad guys. The pope, of course, is horrible. And then there's the good guys. They would be the liberal Catholics. A liberal Catholic, according to Nicholas Kristof, he's probably not wrong about this, are often in dissent against the teachings of the Catholic Church. And he finds anybody who would champion abortion for any reason whatsoever is to be a good person. They do the same thing at the National Catholic Reporter. That is to say, they look through the prism of Marxism, this idea that you have a structures in different society, and you've got a hierarchy, and then you have the rank and file. Look, it's like the communists used to say, we love Americans, it's just your government we hate. Look, if you hate the Pope and the bishops, you hate me, and you hate Orthodox Catholics, who are the only ones who really count these days, because they're the ones who go to church on Sunday and pay the bills to the Catholic Church. There are a lot of these Catholics who have one foot out the door. In some cases, they are outside the door, pretending to be Catholics, and Christoph is among them. There's no two Catholic churches any more than there are two New York Timeses. Yes, you have reporters, but yes, you have an editorial staff, but still one newspaper, and we have one church. The, the laity have a very integral role in the Catholic Church, as we've seen from Vatican II and every pope since that time. But I know my place. I don't speak for the Catholic Church. I speak for the Catholic League, all right? The pope and the bishops, they speak for the Catholic Church. If you don't like it, maybe it's time for you to check out.
Okay, Bill, and here's, a, here's one of our viewers. Uh, this is Linda from Pennsylvania. She writes, thank you, Mr. Donahue, for sharing the truth about people whose mission is to discredit the Catholic faith, even though they claim to be Catholic. Let's pray they have a change of heart, and thank you for being such a warrior. So people are obviously responding, Bill. Here's Jack from Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Jack, very quickly. Yes, uh, Ray, hi. How are uh, you? This is Jack from Pennsylvania. And, Ray, the reason I'm calling is about the rosary. We okay. want to defend the rosary. Yep. Uh, people that wear the rosary with reverence and humility for the sake of the faith are no, next Nobody's attacking the rosary, the Jack. The faith in action, that the Catholic faith is alive and is well, and it's a great weapon against the evil that seeks to destroy the church. Right, but it, it's a great weapon when it's prayed, Jack. I mean, it's, it's yes, too often. I mean, when I see a Dolce and Gabbana uh, runway show and they're wearing nothing but you know skivvies and a rosary, I'm sorry. I think that is a misuse of a sacramental. It it, it, it wasn't meant to be right. no an accessory. It's but meant to be a prayer a young man that aid. the rosary out of reverence and a memory of his family. And he's praying the rosary. Right. We want to we want to have a place for that. Yeah. And, and the only people that don't like the rosary are people that, that don't know the mother of God and don't have a love of the Eucharistic Jesus. Because when you love Jesus in the Eucharist, you love his mother and you love the rosary and you pray the rosary. And I know you love the rosary, Ray. So I just wanted to get good that point, clear. Jack. Very I good. Thank you, Jack. Thanks for calling in. Uh, here's another call, uh, another email correspondent, John, saying, message to Bill Donahue, keep up the good work, and they are, they're supporters of the Catholic League. So, uh, so Bill, I, I, I mean, in the, in, the, in the macro, when you're looking at all of these things, all these little attacks happening and misunderstandings and the media uh, uh, distortions, how, what would be your suggestion to the average person watching? How do they deal with this? What should they well, be doing? Well, they can speak up. I mean, Joy Behar cannot go on to The View, run by Barbara Walters on ABC, and rip the Catholic Church almost daily, certainly weekly. Now she has her own show over at CNN Headline News, unless there's Catholics who simply put up with it. Can't they simply write a letter, have an email? I mean, you know, uh, I, I think they could do more. I am proud, though, that Catholics are stepping up. They're much better off now than we are now than we were 20 years ago. But if you hear an offensive joke at a cocktail party... I'm not asking you to get to a major fight. I'm just simply saying, let that person know you think that was inappropriate, you hurt, that you un unintentionally perhaps hurt me. you got to speak up a little bit more. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be pinatas, people. And I, and I think that, you know what, you win the respect of other people when you politely and gently tell them that you, you've crossed the line. Not about criticism, again, but when you hit below the belt. And some of the stuff that's on television, some of the stuff is said about religion... And they give lots of other groups a pass. This kind of disparity and outrage is not something that we can tolerate any longer. Very good. Bill Donahue, I know one person who's not going to be a pinata for anybody, and that's you. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Uh, for more information on the Catholic League and their work, but especially that Mother Teresa uh, effort that Bill has initiated, you can go to their website, Catholic League. Dot org, CatholicLeague.org. Bill's book, Secular Sabotage, is available at bookstores everywhere. Now, before we go, as if you haven't heard it already, let's cut to the chase. This week in the United States, we have watched the appalling effects of an oil leak in the Gulf of Mexico. Over the last month, the waters of the Gulf have been stained, and now crude has made landfall, fouling the shores of my home state of Louisiana and neighboring states. Over 100 miles of coastline have now been affected. Wildlife and fisheries have been decimated. Coming on the heels of Katrina, the Gulf region is again suffering devastation that will last for decades. The federal response has been pokey and, frankly, inadequate. The current administration was extremely slow to respond to this crisis and, despite a few photo ops, has still not taken a leadership role on the ground or allowed local officials a free hand to protect their own land and people. It put me in mind of the spill of dissent that we've witnessed over the last few months in the church. Dissent, whether from politicians, leaders of so-called Catholic health organizations, or university presidents, confuse millions and sow seeds of relativism. If left unanswered and unaddressed by authentic Catholic authorities, i.e. the bishops and the Holy See, the dissenters become the leaders and lead the flock far away from their home. 
In recent weeks, the bishops have issued statements condemning the dissent of individuals and groups like the Catholic Health Association for their role in the passage of national health care, which funds abortion. But there are other equally toxic dissent spills which must be addressed and cleaned up with haste. As the tragedy in the Gulf so painfully illustrates, waiting and hoping that it will dissipate is always a bad strategy. In the 24-7 news cycle, he who gets the story out first usually wins the day. The dissent is getting out there and spreading. Their voices are full-throated and passionate. Too often, the voices of correction and clarity are muted or non-existent. All of these isolated leaks of dissent, whether they be Catholic funds used to support groups opposed to Catholic teaching or audacious religious sisters defying the body of bishops in public, they add up to one thing, a break of faith. And if that break is not acknowledged and repaired practically and spiritually, the long-term effects will make what we're seeing in the Gulf appear minor in comparison. As we leave you, I want all of you and our family in the Gulf region to know we're praying for you, we're thinking of you, and we stand with you in this terrible tragedy. People in other parts of the country and around the world don't realize this is not just an oil spill, but a grave challenge to our culture and our way of life. Please keep the people of the Gulf region in your prayers and know that you are in ours. Until next week, you can find updates and the occasional commentary by following me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Raymond Arroyo or on my Facebook page. And I'm always at RaymondArroyo.com. The prayers and personal devotions of Mother Angelica makes a wonderful Father's Day gift, and it takes up almost no space in the beach bag. You should consider that. It's at bookstores everywhere. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.